Hi everyone, welcome to Five Quote Shakespeare Hamlet Theme Analysis. In this series, we looked at a total of 14 different themes, and in this one, we're going to finish up re the Revenge mini series. Uh, in the Revenge mini series, there were a total of four videos. In the first one, we looked at the four revenge subplots and tried to explain their significance. In the second one, we looked at Hamlet's revenge dilemma and tried to explain why he couldn't commit revenge due to conflicting cultural influences. In the third video, we looked at the revenge genre itself and we explored some of its plot features and compared it to the film John Wick. And in this video, we'll do the thematic features to finish up the miniseries. Yeah, the John Wick part was a lot of fun, that was for sure. Um, what I do in each video is first identify the important aspects of the theme and apply it to the play, and then we dig deeply into the text of each play and pull out several quotes to prove the connection. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe, and if you make a donation, you get a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. Memento mori, remember that you will die. You might have seen these images somewhere before in me medieval art, or no, not necessarily medieval art. It, it comes out of the medieval period, but even in the Renaissance and, and, and even uh, uh, further on, uh, you would very often see a skull at the bottom of a painting or something, and that's, that's a reminder that our lives are finite and we have to try to live a decent life. Uh, the, the, the flower, of course, is a symbol of life. This is a symbol of death, and there's good old time, time catching up with us. Um, so the, the, the old notion was that we have to remember that we are going to die so that we will live a good life now so that we won't be punished in the afterlife, DC. But even in a post-religious world, which, which to a large extent, not entirely, we are living in now, even if you don't have that afterlife to give you rewards or punishments, we have to find human beings need a reason to behave well in the here and now, do you see? And, 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 and Hamlet doesn't find an answer to that. Uh, but John Wick does, and, and, and Shakespeare does as well. So because the seeking of death is the central plot device of a revenge thriller, it, re thriller, it naturally becomes a memento mori. The whole play itself becomes a memento mori, a reminder that we're going to die from musings on the nature of life and death. And so as we talked about the, the motif of uh, revenge as theater, the motif of death is repeated at intervals throughout the entire play, and we're going to walk through some of those today. If death is inevitable, it is the inevitable end for all of us, including those fighting for the good, even if you're going to die in the end, John Wick is eventually going to die after, I don't know, which, whichever movie he's going to uh, end with, Hamlet certainly dies. And if that's the case, we all die. What's the point anyway? What's the point in living? Why not just, you know, with a bare botkin, end all of our suffering, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune? Why not do that? Why, why try to correct the wrongs of the world like John Wick and Hamlet, why bother doing all that, that stuff? So this question is especially important if no religious answers are available. Now it's really, really interesting that, that Shakespeare usually seems to shy away from a Christian solution. The old medieval uh, uh, morality plays, they, they, end, they end with a, with a more solid resolution because they did believe very, very firmly in, uh, in the redemption in, in a Christian way. So no matter how miserable a life you had here. In fact, the more miserable life you had on earth, the greater rewards you will have in heaven. And that's a very, very satisfying solution. But Shakespeare didn't take that. And I think he, Shakespeare's drama grew out of the morality plays because he would have seen many of them. And that was, that was the zeitgeist. That was the kind of story that was told back in those days. But Shakespeare was of the Renaissance and they started to move away from those simple, simpler and, and satisfying conclusions. And, and, and to, a, to a more existential, uh, exploration of the human condition, do you see? Uh, and, and, and the results are, are much more complicated, but also quite satisfying in themselves. In all but the most nihilistic fiction, now Shakespeare did write some nihilistic fiction. As I said, uh, King Lear is quite nihilistic, uh, um, and maybe Coriolanus as well. Uh, but love is still at the core. Love is still present as a potential uh, uh, re redemptive uh, feature of, of, of the story and of, of human life, uh, as I've mentioned previously in this video. So in all but the most nihilistic fiction, meaning is to be found in the noble struggle itself. Why do we admire John Wick? He goes through all this misery and at, at the end suffers terribly, uh, but we do because it, it is a noble struggle. And what makes it a noble struggle? It's a sacrifice of oneself for others. Harry Potter, Frodo, Spider-Man, oh my goodness, Christ, of course, oh my goodness. Go on and on and on and on and on. Everybody that you admire, Everybody is in some way self-sacrificing, even in your own lives. It's true. Think about it. Ah, oh, goodness, it's, it's, it's the only story we will ever tell, and it's the only answer we will have to the existential question. The existential question in John Wick, life has no rhyme or reason. That's at the very beginning of the movie. 
The friend comes up to John Wick and says, yeah, your wife died. It's not your fault. There is no rhyme or reason to, 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 to life. So the question that we ask ourselves then is, well, what are you going to do? If life is indeed meaningless, there's no spiritual afterlife, there's no rewards in heaven, there's no punishment in hell. If that's the case, what are you going to do about it, guy? Go ahead, be a nihilist, be the Joker, watch the Joker movie, that's the nihilist, burn everything down, or you can try to live nobly. And that, that nobility is what uh, redeems us as humans. So in John Wick, the story opens with musings on the nature of death, as I've pointed out uh, before. He, he does. The opening scene is him. Pretty much we think he's dying or he dies. With Marcus consoling John about the death of his wife, that's this question here, and images of his own death. Uh, after the struggle, justice prevails at the end of the movie, of course, and John's complete being is reborn in the symbol of his wife's love. He gets the new dog, and the dog is not just a stupid dog, of course. The dog is a symbol of life. It's a symbol of rebirth. It's this particular symbol here. It's a symbol of, of, uh, of a life worth living, a life in love, DC. A new dog, an affirmation of the rightness of living despite inevitable suffering, death, and the world's cruelty. We all know that, as I've mentioned uh, uh, in this video as well, we all know life's suffering to, in minor degrees. We don't go through what John Wick goes through. Some of us do close, do you see? But most of us don't. But even in our own minor ways, we understand that life is suffering. Uh, but it is that, that, that end. That, why is that end so upli uplifting? Why do we love? Why do we give billions of dollars to movies like John Wick and Harry Potter? Why? Because we want to see this. We want to see that our, our lives, not Harry Potter's, but our lives actually have some meaning. And they do. And the fact that this outpouring of emotion and this love and this billions of dollars, it suggests to me that that, that is an answer, a, a really, really deep answer. So that memento mori is, is, is with us and it's necessary to remind us of what good action looks like. And here it is in the, in the, uh, in the David Tennant version of Hamlet. Look at that. There's the gravedigger who has a balanced understanding a not a corrupt, not a nihilistic sense of the world. He recognizes death and he can eat a sandwich at the same time that he's eating death, that he's dealing with death and he can deal with life at the same time. He's a much more balanced, likable kind of guy. Hamlet, not so. He's, he's, he has a hard time accepting death. He hasn't, uh, he hasn't come to terms with it in, in a mature way. He's still a naive child in many ways. Okay, so death as a motif. Let's go back and look at that. Right at the beginning of the play, we see death as a fascinating motif. Uh, Shakespeare creates a fascination. He reminds us of our fascination. He doesn't have to tell us. He reminds us of our own fascination and mis mysterious uh, uh, notions of death, our fear and our sadness of death, right at the very, very beginning. So the ghost says, coming back from the, from the realm of death, uh, coming back from the undiscovered country from which no traveler returns, he does return, uh, but that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house. I would, I would a tale unfold whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul. I've coming back from the dead, but I can't tell you anything about it. Aren't you intrigued now? Aren't you fascinated? So Shakespeare starts off, uh, starts the, 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 the death fascination ball early. Uh, roll early. So fear and sadness. Hamlet says in Act 3, he says, death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns. Again, he, 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 he restates, reminds us of our fear and sadness and fascination and mysterious feelings about death. Uh, and ironically, someone did return, do you see? So here's Hamlet again. At the very, very end, we see uh, a, a death as a motif. Hamlet muses philosophically, existentially. He asks the question again, and he's outraged about death. He sees the gravedigger joking around in the grave while he's dealing death. And Hamlet says, "Is this fellow? has this fellow no feeling of his business? Doesn't he understand what he's doing? <gasps> Shock and horror. He's dealing with death. Doesn't he understand that? He's singing while he's grave making. My goodness. And Horatio, the wiser Benvolio friend, says, custom has made it in him a property of easiness. So he's, he's gotten used to it. And Hamlet, this is why we can't hate, hate Hamlet. He's very, very wise here. He says, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's even so. It is so. The hand of little employment, the poor little rich boy like me, who's got nothing else to do but muse about death all the time, melancholy, uh, this emo kind of guy like me, I have the daintier sense. That's a bit of self-hate, do you see? Uh, it's an honest self-appraisal. He knows that he has these luxury beliefs. He has the time and the energy and the money. His daddy pays for his education in, in Wittenberg, and he can sit around musing about death and writing poetry about it, do you see? Meanwhile, the rest of us has to have to get on with our lives. It's the first world problems thing and the luxury beliefs. 
notion. Uh, uh, so we, we like Hamlet for this. Uh, he's honest with himself. He doesn't, he doesn't delude himself there, although he delude, deludes himself in other places. So here's another example of the motif of death, of course, the existential musings, this, this lovely... And again, I just made fun of him for being this kind of poet with his head in the clouds. I just made fun of him. But at the same time, we go back to Hamlet again and again and again because of this lovely poetry. We know how sad death is, and we want to be reminded of it so that we can share that experience with others and find some redemption in, in, that, uh, in that, that outrageous the indignation and the disbelief that we have uh, for the, the, the reality of death. We want some kind of redemption, something good to come out of that. And so Hamlet sees the skull <clears throat> of poor Yorick, D.C., who was his childhood buddy. Uh, and he says, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy. He hath borne me on his back when I was a kid a thousand times, and now look at him how abhorred in my ima imagination it is. Now, we all relate to that, all of us. And it's a, is it a first world problem? No, of course it's not. It's, 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 it's what we are as human beings. We have to come to, deal, we have to, come to terms with this. Um, the sacrificed hero, of course, is, is, a, is a riff on the, uh, the death motif, and that's repeated again and again throughout the play, as we've talked about already. So the noble struggle and the noble, the noble death is the answer to the existential question. How did you live your life? The service to others, the attempt, no matter how futile, to make the world better, to heal the wasteland, that is what we admire in all of our hero stories, all of them. The, 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 the superhero stories, the silly plots of the superhero stories, this is what we come back to admire, a, a, a life well lived in the service of others. It's the existential question. Ask this to yourself. At my death, will I be worthy of good Benvolio's, Horatio's love? Will I be worthy of the love of good people? That's the existential question, and, the, and it's an easy, easy answer if you think about it, DC. So again, uh, it's not first world problems. It's something that we all have to ap approach. And the beauty with which Shakespeare ends Hamlet's life elevates and ennobles uh, and supports our, our assessment of, yes, he tried. He failed. Not really, because he did heal the wasteland by getting rid of Claudius, but he was a tragic figure, and our sympathy goes out to him. Now cracks a noble heart, says good old Horatio. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful poetry, and it's the beauty that elevates it, DC, the beauty of the language. Um, Fortinbras says a similar thing at the end. He says, uh, 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 bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage. There's the stage again, the theater, revenge of theater. But he gives good words to Hamlet. He says he tried. He did his best, and he did some good in the world, and thus he dies, and thus he deserves our love. Bear Hamlet like a soldier to the stage, for he was likely, had he been put on, to have proved most royal. He, if he had had the chance, if he had had different circumstances, he might have been a very good king. So there's pity and admiration for the sacrificed hero, a story we will never stop watching. And that was Five Quotes Shakespeare, Hamlet theme analysis, the end of the Revenge miniseries. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, come back for my next video, Thought versus Action. If you found these videos useful, please like and subscribe. And if you make a donation, you get a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. Thanks for watching.